Thus far, most of the differential equations that we've been working with are linear or affine, but there's a lot more beyond the linear and affine equations that are very, very useful. Some of these we're not going to be able to solve, but some of these can be handled using similar techniques to what we've been doing. To get started, let's think of the following example. Consider a tank, a tank full of water, and there's a hole in the bottom of the tank, and the water is spilling out, it's draining out, and the height of the fluid in that tank is doing what? Well, it's decreasing. But at what rate? There's a differential equation for this, based on a physics principle called Torricelli's law. And it says the following, consider the differential equation dh dt, where h is the height of the fluid in that tank as a function of time t. The rate of change dh dt is going to be proportional by some constant of proportionality alpha, with a negative sign out front, times h to the one half, the square root of the height. Is that it? No, that's not it. We got to keep going because you need to take that quantity and divide it by a, the cross-sectional area of the tank, incorporating the geometry into the equation. Now, this is where it gets really interesting because that cross-sectional area itself may depend on the height. It may change as h is decreasing. So capital A, function of h. What do we do with this? Well, just like before, we're going to separate out both sides and then integrate. What do I mean by that? Let's get all the t terms on one side. So multiplying through by dt. On the right, we have dt times minus alpha. On the left, we have the h terms, including the dh. And multiplying both sides through by a, we have capital A as a function of h. And then dividing both sides by h to the 1 half, we multiply the left hand side by h to the negative 1 half. Now we've got all the h terms on the left, all the t terms on the right. We integrate both sides, solve for h. Now rather than do so exactly, what I'd like to do is focus on the asymptotics as the fluid is running out. What is happening in the limit as h is going to 0? Let's do a simple example. We're going to start off in the case where that cross-sectional area is constant. Let's say it's a cylindrical tank, something like that. Cross-sectional area is some constant. Let's call it C0. We're not going to actually care about constants since we're doing asymptotics. Plugging that constant in for A on the left-hand side, I have to integrate h to the negative 1 half dh. You do that, you get h to the 1 half times some constant. Forget about that. On the right-hand side, when I integrate negative alpha dt, I get some constant times t plus another constant. Let's bundle all that up and say that the right-hand side integrates to c1 minus c2 times t, since that height is going to zero and time is going forward. Now, solving for h, and again, ignoring constants, we get h equals quantity c1 minus c2t squared. Now, to investigate the asymptotics, what is happening as the height goes to zero, let's replace that c1 minus c2t with a new variable, an asymptotic variable called omega. And this omega represents how much time there is until the height goes to zero, how much time until the water runs out. So as omega goes to zero, h is in big O of omega squared. And that tells us something. That says that in the end, as the water is running out, that height is not going down linearly with the time left. It's going down quadratically. Now compare that to what happens when instead of a cylindrical tank, we have a conical tank. Let's say that the tank comes to a point at the bottom and that's where all the fluid is leaking out. What happens in that case? Well, we need to discern that cross-sectional area in the limit as h goes to zero. I'm going to leave it to you to show that for a conical tank, that cross-sectional area goes quadratically in h. It's some constant c0 times h squared. You could verify that in the case of a square pyramid or a round cone. You can check and see that that works. 
plugging in some constant times h squared for a on the left-hand side, we see that that left-hand integrand is in big O of h to the 3 halves. That's 2 minus 1 half. Integrate h to the 3 halves, what do I get? I get h to the 5 halves times a constant that we're going to throw in the trash on the right-hand side. That right-hand side still being c1 minus c2t or omega. Solving for h means raising both sides to the two-fifths power, and in the end, what we get is that the height goes to zero as omega to the two-fifths. Now that is very cool. If you compare what is happening in these two different cases, what's the difference between omega squared, which goes to zero very, very slowly, with omega to the two-fifths, which as omega is going to zero, Boom, that just goes right to zero. Why? Because you've got that two-fifths power. And you can really see the difference if you watch fluid exiting from a tank in this way. That's one example of an interesting nonlinear differential equation, but here's another. Think back to when we did the drag force on a falling body reaching terminal velocity. We had that affine equation. Now, what happens if we change it up a bit? If instead of saying that the drag force is proportional to the velocity, let's say that it's proportional to the velocity squared. In the case of quadratic drag, we have the differential equation m times dv dt equals mg minus kappa v squared. This is not linear. We cannot apply our previous solution. So what do we do? Well, we can just... Do the same thing that we did previously. Separate out the t terms on one side, the v terms on the other, and integrate. Multiplying through by dt. On the right, we have dt. On the left, dividing both sides by mg minus kappa v squared, we have m times dv divided by mg minus kappa v squared. All right, almost done. We just got to integrate both sides. I'll tell you what, I'll take the right-hand side. I'll integrate dt for you. Boom. Done. Uh, how are you doing with that left-hand side? Is it going okay for you? No? Having a hard time. Yeah. This one's not so easy. How do we integrate something like that? Are we going to learn how to integrate something like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we'll learn. I'll teach you how to do that, but it's not going to be easy. It's not obvious. It's not straightforward. Do we really need to integrate this? Well, it would be nice to be able to solve a nonlinear differential equation, but newsflash, people, it's tough. And we're not always going to be able to use integration easily to solve these. We may have to learn a few new ideas.